Vivi Valdez popped a gummy bear into her mouth as she settled in for her fourth evening of low-key surveillance. It was one of her favorite parts of the job. She was alone, free to proceed as she liked. On the first day, she had identified an office suite across the street from her target that emptied out by 6 p.m. Since then, she'd spent the evening sprawled on industrial carpet in front of a picture window with eyes on the entrance to the Genetic Research Institute of Toronto. She'd hacked Grit's closed-circuit security cameras in the lobby so she could watch their feed from her phone and made note of every entrance and exit, cross-referencing with her list of Grit's staff and associates. On the second night, she'd broken in. That had been a fun evening, figuring out the weaknesses in each level of high-tech security. Once she was in, though, Vivi had found the labs kind of creepy. She had stolen classified information from, at last count, four hostile nations, and she was very comfortable sneaking around in the dark. But the lab was full of things she couldn't interpret. Equipment humming through the night, screens showing what were either elaborate screensavers or magnifications of very tiny organisms reproducing as she watched, glowing liquid, actually glowing, that she imagined would do horrible things to anything it touched, or possibly turn her into an angst-ridden superhero. Vivi's initial brief was too vague for her to figure out what she was looking for in that morass, so she had planted a bug in the office of Dr. Nathaniel Sturgis, director of research, and gotten the hell out, with plans to return once she had more intel. Now Sturgis's droning voice was feeding directly into her earbud as he dictated a report. Distribution mechanism appears to have been effective. Evidence indicates the process was initiated after fewer than six hours, causing the predicted responses. Vivi couldn't tell if he was talking about an amoeba or a person, but it sounded sinister. So she made a note of the timestamp to flag this section for the analysts at Langley. At this point, Sturgis's voice was enough to trigger her gag reflex. Two days of listening had convinced Vivi that he was a pig, Dismissive of undergraduates, bullying of research assistants, and a self-satisfied name-dropper with anyone he thought he could get something out of. But he was mentioned by name in the Level 2 Surveillance Directive, and he was annoyingly cagey about a lot of his research. Vivi was betting that when she got her expanded orders, they would include nailing him for something juicy. Realm presents Orphan Black. The next chapter, starring Tatiana Maslany. Episode 1. Vivi decapitated another bear, an indulgence that was unlikely to leave crumbs, feeling lazy but productive, which was more relaxing than when she was on agency-mandated vacation. She loved the buzz of being on the job. Even if Canada was technically a friendly nation, maybe especially because Canada was a friendly nation, any mistakes would have consequences. Vivi's phone rang, a muted burbling that told her it was Arun. She rolled away from the window, bounced to her feet, and tapped in her coat. Valdez, minimally secure line, she answered. Hey, kiddo. How's Canada treating you? Vivi grinned but kept it out of her voice. A little too cold for me, and way too polite. The language isn't giving you any problem? Arun's voice was a shade too innocent, but Vivi couldn't help taking the bait. This is Ontario. Still, Arun commented mildly. You never know when you might run into some French. Vivi rolled her eyes. Her lack of facility with languages was a running joke in their unit. If only she could fake her way through a foreign language as well as she could another persona, she'd be the perfect chameleon. At least when I do a British accent, I don't sound Australian. What do you mean, mate? Arun said. My British accent is brilliant, whoop. It was a stupid joke that they'd been telling each other with variations for years, ever since that incident in Cape Town. But Vivi still felt the urge to giggle. She stomped it down. I've got a link into the closed-circuit TV in the lobby and a bug in the director's office, she said. And then, because it sounded too sudden, and I haven't heard any French yet. Arun instantly switched to Sirius. Any indications so far? Sturgis was on the phone yesterday reassuring someone that the project was on schedule and that he was seeing as-expected results of the live test. 
Could be anything. Arun commented. Sure. But Sturgis was all coy about not mentioning the project name. He even asked if they could give it a code designation. Arun guffawed, and Vivi let herself smile into the phone, knowing he couldn't see her. Heavens preserve us from amateurs, he said. Of course, Vivi went on, and this time she couldn't keep the bubble of conspiratorial joy from her voice. He had his secretary place the call, so I know he was talking to Greg Kurtzman, civilian liaison officer in the Bureau of Unconventional Weapon Protocols. There was a silence on the other end of the call. Ministry of Defense, Arun said at last. Is that what this is about? A chill slithered down Vivi's spine. Some kind of bioweapon? Arun cleared his throat. As I told you Monday, I got this handed to me from another agency that was looking to get eyes on this facility ASAP, so I didn't have the details. An hour ago, I was briefed, although they're maintaining compartmentalization on some of the intel. He paused, and Vivi, hovering on the balls of her feet as she waited, had to bite her lip not to prompt him. There was a biological incident in Boston last week. Some people with links to the agency got sick. So far, no fatalities. Vivi was stunned. They carried out an attack in the States on agents? Not okay. Not on her watch. Not agents. Arun seemed unusually uncomfortable. Family. That was, if anything, worse. Vivi's parents were dead, in the line of duty, both of them. And she had no other close family, but the implications were still terrifying. If someone was willing to attack civilians to target the agency, that might explain something else. Vivi took a deep breath, reorganized, reclaimed her cool competency. This morning, Sturgis left the facility at an unusual hour. I trailed him, expecting to end up at a cafe, but he went straight to a subway station. She left a breath-long pause for drama. To use the payphone. Suspicious indeed, Arun agreed. But hard to listen in on. Vivi grinned. I had a directional mic. It looked like a dangly dark earring, and if she could point it in exactly the right direction, it picked up recordable sound from a surprising distance. Of course, I only got his side of the conversation, but he was extremely agitated. Vivi prowled the dark room, ruffling her auburn curls as she spoke. He said that he had looked more closely at the genomes, and now he understood, and he was furious, and, I think, scared. Desperate, maybe. He kept saying, I didn't sign up for this, and I trusted you, and what were you thinking, and he said something about a tag. Like genetic markers, maybe? Arun asked thoughtfully. Maybe, Vivi agreed quickly wanting to move on past the part where she hadn't been able to hear the whole sentence. But the best part was the ending. He said, if anyone comes after me, you'll never get it. Arun was silent on the other end of the line. Do we know anything else about what happened? Vivi asked. If there was an attack on families, why don't we have the whole goddamn cavalry here laying waste to the place? It's complicated, Arun said. Vivi could imagine him rubbing the back of his neck. As I said, no fatality so far, and they're not even 100% sure that it was an attack. In fact, you might as well know. When my friend asked the agency to look into the illnesses, the boss said there wasn't enough evidence. This inquiry is unofficial, a favor. Arun's voice sounded rueful now. That's why there's less background than usual. Why is your friend so sure it was an attack? Are they a doctor? She isn't sure, but she said it was too suspicious to ignore. Apparently, a small group became ill suddenly, almost at the same time, with an illness that has not yet been identified. The thing is, only agency-related people have gotten sick. No one else, no doctors, roommates, co-workers. They still don't understand the vectors. But the combination of unknown illness and such a precisely affected group is raising all kinds of flags. Okay, Vivi answered. What about this place? Knowing he couldn't see her, she gestured at the shiny glass box of the institute across the street anyway. Nothing too clear, which is why you're there, on your own, watching them quietly. He paused. 
You are watching quietly, right? So far, Vivi growled. I'm inclined to up the volume at this point. If the director is talking that way to the Ministry of Defense, then I am too. I want you back in there tonight. Vivi grinned. Remember, this is still circumstantial, Arun said firmly. It's possible it was accidental, coincidental, something other than a fucking attack on the intelligence community of a friendly foreign nation. A pause, maybe for him to collect himself from an unusual display of emotion. If it wasn't an accident, we need to know who ordered it. I was imagining some rogue actor or deep cover foreign operative within the research group. But the call to Kurtzman suggests the Canadian government could be skating on thin ice. And if Sturgis is getting cold feet, he's likely got something to hide. Arun paused. Go find it. My pleasure, Vivi said, baring her teeth. Should I target Sturgis for interrogation? Not yet, Arun said. Given the friendly nation status, we want to keep this stealth for now. Find out if we're dealing with a weapon or a fuck-up, and certainly anything about an antidote. Antidote, Vivi thought, was one of those words you never wanted to have to use. Understood, she said, her pulse speeding as she readied herself for action. Be careful, okay? What? Vivi asked. She wasn't sure whether she was pleased Arun was worried about her, or annoyed that after all the missions they had partnered on, he didn't think she could take care of herself. I'm just saying, I wouldn't want to mess with this stuff. Arun answered. On Vivi's screen, someone hurried into the grit lobby and up to the reception desk. Microbes and germs and disease and... Vivi's bug crackled to life, catching the call into Sturgis's office and his irritated voice answering. Yes, oh, oh yes, of course. Send her in. Gotta go, Vivi whispered and closed the call with Arun to focus on the video. The resolution on the security cameras wasn't great, but something about the woman drew her eye. Vivi couldn't figure out quite what. She was annoyed to see someone come into the offices so late, it was nearly seven. Based on her last few nights of observation, the GRIT staff seemed to be a pretty nine-to-five bunch. She hadn't been expecting any evening meetings, and she was eager for everyone to clear out so she could get in there. But maybe this was part of the secret project. Her heart was still pounding from Arun's last warning, but more than anything else, she wanted to clear up the uncertainty and find out exactly what she was up against. She waited impatiently for the woman to get to Sturgis's office and was rewarded by the sound of the door opening. Sturgis going out to the anteroom to greet her, and then their voices as they returned in mid-greeting. Honor, I've been following your research for years. The pleasure is mine, Dr. Niehaus. I'm quite impressed with what I know of your work. Vivi scribbled down the name with a question mark about the spelling. Um, thank you. Niehaus sounded surprised, maybe even suspicious. Since I only recently finished my doctorate, I haven't had a chance to publish as much of my research as I'd like yet. Of course, I understand. Vivi could picture Sturgis waving his hands genially. And I'm sure the adjunct job doesn't leave you much time. That's why I was so pleased you applied for this position. Tell me, why are you interested in working at GRID? I'm looking to get into something more research-intensive and more engaged with real-world issues. Get out of the ivory tower, you know. Niehaus said. Her voice was interesting, a little older-sounding than Vivi had expected, with a touch of hoarseness as though she smoked. And was that a faint trace of an American West Coast accent? Vivi whispered, ivory tower, into the darkness, copying Niehaus's vowel sounds experimentally. I want to get my hands dirty, Niehaus went on. I want to work on stuff that matters. Vivi imagined her gesturing her emphasis. Indeed, indeed. Sturgis boomed genially. This was the nicest Vivi had ever heard him, and her spy senses were tingling again. Was this more of a recruitment than a job interview? I can tell you that some of the work we do for the Canadian government here at GRID is exactly in your area of interest, and you would certainly be able to get your hands dirty. Vivi could hear the ooze in his voice as he emphasized every word. 
Maybe he was hitting on Niehaus instead of recruiting her? Slimeball. What exactly are we talking about here? Niehaus said, cautious again. The job posting was a little vague. I'm afraid I can't give you the details until you sign the NDA. But I can tell you the project is extremely well-resourced and ties into your work on genome mapping and gene-based vaccinations. It matters, as you said. Potentially world-changing. Vivi could imagine him standing slowly and working his way around the desk, placing a heavy hand on Niehaus's shoulder. Then Sturgis coughed a little fake cough, and the mental image evaporated. He was still at his desk and he was nervous about something. But then, we both know that changing the world can go both ways, don't we? After all, you do have quite a lot of useful experience that doesn't show up on your CV. Vivi raised her eyebrows at the awkward silence, wondering if Niehaus had worked her way through university as an escort or exotic dancer. But then she answered, I haven't published any of my work on gene-based vaccinations and Vivi imagined her tilting her head, waiting for Sturgis to explain why he had been stalking her. Exactly, Sturgis pounced. Excellent work with real positive potential, but no one is interested in it. This is an opportunity for you to carry forward the research that you haven't published, the work you haven't been able to share, the stuff you've done that's just a little beyond the cutting edge. That is exactly what I was trying to do make things better by moving forward. Though, of course, anything with the potential to help people also has the potential to hurt people. But we still have to try, don't we? For science, even if it's terrifying. The science that people are afraid of, and you have some experience with that. Listening, Vivi held her breath. This was the worst recruitment attempt she'd ever heard, but... The science that people are afraid of sounded like exactly what she needed to know. I don't know what you mean by that, the woman said. Vivi winced. If Niehaus was getting recruited to work on a classified project, she was going to have to get a lot better at lying. Come on, Sturgis said. He sounded frustrated that she wasn't playing along. There's no need to pretend. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. I want your help. In fact, I'm a little surprised you don't have your dyad work on your CV. For anyone serious about this kind of work, it's a very impressive credential and quite rare. We're particularly interested in your experience on... I was only there briefly, Niehaus said, cutting him off. And it was a long time ago. Something had shifted in the room, Vivi thought, trying to come up with search terms she could add to dyad to get meaningful results. Genetics, maybe. If the mood had changed, Sturgis gushed on without noticing. We could really use your help. I could really use your perspective on some of the uh, issues that have come up. There are ethical quandaries that um, your experience at Dyad may give you insight into. And this is important work, very important. Believe me, Dr. Niehaus, if you want to have an impact, this is the way to do it. After all, nothing spurs scientific advancement like a clear and present threat. Vivi was listening so hard she was leaning into the hand that pressed the earbud to her ear, not wanting to miss the slightest nuance. What kind of threat? Niehaus asked. She sounded as though the possibility of danger was all too believable. Vivi wondered why. By this point, she had found Niehaus's page in the University of Toronto adjunct professor directory. There was no picture, but based on her CV, Cosima Niehaus seemed like a normal researcher. Maybe too normal. Was she a foreign operative that Sturgis had somehow gotten wind of? Sturgis's voice got louder, and Vivi pictured him leaning over the bug-eyed cartoon DNA paperweight where the recording device was hidden. I'm sure you can imagine. I'm sure you've already imagined. The technology Dyad was working with But a decade later, imagine what we could do with it. Imagine what other governments might be doing with it. Vivi heard the scrape of a chair like Niehaus was getting to her feet quickly. She was spluttering something, but Sturgis talked over her. 
Your experience would make you a unique asset to the project. He was still talking, but the woman's voice broke through clearly. I'm withdrawing my application. Excuse me? Sturgis sounded like he couldn't believe his ears. You're trying to recruit me for some government-funded project that you say might change the world, but which you can't tell me anything about? Or are the details above your pay grade? In her deserted office building across the street, Vivi pumped her fist approvingly. Well, but it's quite... I have a very important role. What a come mierda, Vivi thought. Despite being the daughter of Cuban immigrants, Vivi hadn't been able to master Spanish, but she had managed to solidly internalize the curse words. I'm sure it's very important, but I'm out. And I know you're not going to listen, but believe me, Dyad is not a model to emulate. Wait, Sturgis said. Vivi heard footsteps and cursed silently that this fascinating conversation was about to leave the room. Think about it. This is an amazing opportunity for you. Or do you want to be an adjunct forever? There are worse things. An elegantly timed pause. I suspect you're growing some of them in this lab. The door swung shut. Vivi hadn't found anything on Dyad, but that last sentence jolted her to her feet. This woman wasn't the mild-mannered adjunct professor she appeared to be in her profile. She clearly didn't know exactly what was going on at Grit, but if she could make an educated guess, then she might be worth cultivating. With one of the snap judgments she was, in certain limited communities, famous for, Vivi leapt up and ran for the stairwell. She barreled down three flights of stairs, then dodged across the street, slowing to a walk as she wrapped a scarf around the lower half of her face. The woman shoved open the glass front doors of grit and stomped out. Vivi passed quietly behind her, glancing up for a glimpse of Niehaus's profile. What she saw startled her so much that she misstepped, bumping up against the other woman's shoulder. Unable to even mumble an apology, Vivi walked faster, mind spinning with confusion. Niehaus called out, but Vivi only walked faster. She turned at the end of the block and then, as soon as she was out of sight, stopped dead, breathing hard. Niehaus was exactly Vivi's height, probably 10 pounds heavier with glasses and dark hair twisted into locks. She didn't ring any watchless bells, but Vivi's skin was crawling. Looking at her face had been like catching a glimpse of herself in an angled mirror. Kasima stared after the woman who had just bumped into her. Hey, she yelled. But the woman ignored her, and Kasima's quick anger melted away while she patted her pockets absently to make sure they hadn't been picked. She had bigger problems than some trivial rudeness. Fuck. Kasima's pulse was still racing, fight or flight chemicals coursing through her body, along with disappointment. She had been looking forward to this interview, really hopeful that it would be the break into cutting edge science that she'd been craving. And instead, still feeling her pockets, Kasima found a forgotten blunt from, she sniffed at it, probably her paladin's bruise strain. That was something at least. She lit it up and inhaled as she walked toward where she had parked her bike, trying to calm down. How could he know about Dyad? She had never put it on her CV, never publicized her involvement through her already scant social media presence. Delphine admitted to it, of course. Her involvement had been too public to deny, but she downplayed it, and Cosima never mentioned it anywhere. She inhaled pensively. Sturgis had seemed to think following in Dyad's footsteps was a good thing. And, Cosima felt a flare of the old excitement. There was certainly lots of science left to be done. Maybe? But then she remembered how he'd been talking about it. Cosima wasn't sure what was scarier. The idea that foreign nations might be using genetic technology for evil, or the fact that Canada had a top-secret research project studying that same technology. No, she was evading the truly terrifying part, that they were trying to make her part of it. If they knew about Dyad, what else might they know? Nothing, 
There was no reason to think they knew anything more than that. Maybe there was an old Dyad staff directory online somewhere, or... Kasima jumped as her phone rang. Her burner phone. Hey, Kasima said, taking another deep hit on her joint to compose herself. What's going on? Hey. Sarah sounded, as usual, exasperated and in a rush. Kira's on her way into the city to see you. What? Any calm the weed had brought evaporated. We have Charlotte staying with us tonight. It's not really the best time. I can't deal with her right now, Cos. She fights me on everything. She wanted to go into the city anyway and... Into the city? Where are you? Sarah's tone changed. Cal and I are trying to patch things up again. Kasima almost laughed. Oh, I totally see why Kira wants to get out of the way. But can't she stay with Felix or Allison? Sarah blew air in exasperation. Colin's parents are visiting, so Felix is out. And Allison's place is such a pain to get to. Kira hates Bailey down. So it has to be you. You guys have that great basement apartment. But Charlotte's already there. It's important, Cos, and it's just for a few days. Kasima hesitated, and as always, Sarah knew exactly when she had won. Cheers, Cos. I owe you one. Listen, Sarah, something's just come up. Kasima started hesitantly, but the line was already dead. With something between a growl and a sigh, Kasima stubbed out the joint on her shoe and walked the rest of the way to her bike. Kasima locked her bike with her fingerprint and hurried up the front steps to let herself into the ramshackle Victorian she and Delphine were fixing up. The lights were on in the basement, so Charlotte was already there. The younger clone lived with her foster father, Art. Charlotte adored him, and Kasima thought the relationship had been good for Art and the rest of his family, too. But Charlotte had always indulged her interest in science with Kasima and Delphine. That bond had increased since she started university a year earlier, and on the night she had late classes or when she had a tough problem set, she would stay over with them. Kasima had spent two hours helping Charlotte prep for her organic chemistry midterm last night, and she knew she should go down and find out how it went. But right now, she needed to talk to her wife. She found Delphine in the kitchen, putting the finishing touches on some French version of beef stew. Smells great, Kasima said, sniffing as she stepped in. In fact, her stomach was too roiled with anxiety for anything to seem appealing at the moment. But now that the kitchen was finished, Delphine had been making an effort to get them out of the Uber Eats habit they had developed during the first stage of the renovations, and she was all in favor. You think so? Delphine asked, flashing Cosima one of those shy smiles that, after six years of marriage, still sped up her heart. How was the interview? Cosima took in a shaky breath. I think we can assume I'm not getting the job. Oh no, I'm sorry, Cherie. Delphine put down the wooden spoon and turned her full attention to her wife. It didn't go well. She handed Kasima the glass of red on the counter, at the same time cupping her cheek to bring her in for a quick kiss. Oh, they offered it to me, Kasima said around a gulp of wine. I told them to go fuck themselves. Delphine blinked at her. What? What happened? Grit is a very well-respected institute. Wait, did Dr. Sturgis make some kind of inappropriate suggestion? I heard some rumors. Ha! <laughs> Kasima blew out a laugh of relief. No. Well, maybe, but not the kind you think. She took a deep breath. They're up to something there, he said. Delphine waited, then prompted her when she didn't go on. Kasima still hesitated. Can we talk about this outside? Of course, just let me. While Delphine fiddled with the stove, Kasima let her eyes drift around the kitchen. It was the first room they redid when they started renovations on the originally dilapidated house, and it still felt the most like home to Kasima. It was warm, for one thing, while the still under renovation living room was drafty, and the small touches that they had unpacked as soon as it was ready reminded Kasima of the travels she had shared with Delphine 
as they work to vaccinate clones all over the world. A spice rack from Brazil, a hanging vase from Japan now offering a single chrysanthemum, the cloth placemats Delphine had brought from her home in Paris. On the wall by the table hung Cosima's favorite picture from their wedding. They were both laughing. It had been taken during Felix's toast. But Cosima was slightly out of focus, drawing the attention to Delphine, sharp and glowing in her beauty. The picture tickled an alert in Cosima's mind, one that only got louder as her eyes dropped to the table, a big wood trestle they'd picked up in Quebec, currently adorned with wildflowers in a vase and candles. Oh, shit. Delphine, it's our anniversary. It is. Delphine agreed, looking back over her shoulder with a smile as she took off her apron. That over-the-shoulder look always killed Cosima. And I was late, and I've got all this shit going on. Delphine was still smiling, and Cosima trailed off. It's all right, Cherie. Dinner will wait. Come and tell me what happened. You're listening to Orphan Black, the next chapter. Starring Tatiana Maslany. Produced by Realm. Your portal to another world. Orphan Black, the next chapter, is written by Malka Older, Lindsay Smith, Madeline Ashby, Michelle Baker, E.C. Myers, and Helly Kennedy. Produced by Marco Palmieri and executive produced by Molly Barton, Julian Yap, David Fortier, Ivan Shebeg, and Carrie Appleyard. In partnership with Boat Rocker Media and BBC America. Audio produced, sound designed, and edited by Amanda Rose Smith. Based on the television series Orphan Black. Produced by Temple Street, a division of Boat Rocker Studios. The theme music is by Two Fingers.